Welcome back to the booth here at Mythic Championship 4 from Barcelona. Marshall Sutcliffe with Paul Chion. And we're down the stretch. This is, of course, where the real fireworks start because everything's on the line for these players, often in a situation where a loss will eliminate them from top eight contention. Yeah, the players that we're going to watch today in this round all have three losses. So at X and 4, it is very, very difficult. Usually one maybe two in the most rare of situations uh, will be able to squeak in at X and four, but a loss is pretty devastating here. Very, very likely that if you lose this round, you no longer have a chance at the top That's eight. That's right. We had, you know, 400 and, I don't know, 70 whatever players right. in the field. It's going to be really tough at X and four uh, to make it in. Now, we're going to be kicking things off on uh, David Mines versus Jacob Wilson. And uh, that is going to be Mardo Shadow versus Jund. As you mentioned, both players with an 11 and 3 record and not, not a comfortable amount of wiggle room to give. No, and yeah, this matchup is, um, you know, kind of a classic mid range matchup here. I think Jacob Wilson wants to be the aggressor here. He does have a lot of hand disruption and he has a lot of ways to kind of actually try and protect Death Shadow. He has 10 pieces of hand disruption. You know, uh, and on top of that, something like a Ranger Captain of Eos allows you to even find additional copies of Death Shadow if David Mines does have, you know, a Fatal Push or an Assassin's Trophy to deal with them. But yes, Jacob Wilson, a lot of experience playing the deck, actually got, was the person who kind of pushed for this deck as he did test with Andrew Beckstrom, who did a deck tech on this earlier and said uh, Jacob Wilson was actually the kind of person who spent the most time working and tuning this list. Here's Tide Hollow Sculler to kick things off for Jacob Wilson. That's going to let him look at all the cards in David's hand. Now, there are some matchups where that Tide Hollow Sculler, you can expect it to stay on the battlefield kind of for the duration. Uh, Jund, not necessarily. <laughs> right. Although, you know, he does take the Fatal Push here, and the Renin mm -hmm. 6, not really great in this matchup in the sense that it's not really going to be able to pick off any creatures. Of course, a lot of the value in Renin 6 is also just the fact that you can get those lands and make sure you hit those land drops over the course of a game. It just accrues a lot of card advantage. Yeah, speaking of value, I, I don't know if you caught that, but on the bottom of David's library, Baron Moore. Mm. Get that value train rolling. That's a much later in the game scenario, though, because right now, he's got to get... <coughs> He's got to get things working very quickly. Yeah, David really trying to maximize on the Ren and Six here with not only Baron Moore, but also a copy of Tranquil Thicket. So Ren and Six, Jeez. you know, doing kind of a, a life from the loam impression there while also having utility by being good against a lot of the one toughness creatures expected coming into this event. The, the Hogak deck has a ton of one toughness creatures. You're talking about Insulin Neonate, you have the Stitcher Supplier. Don't really want to be killing Stitcher Supplier, but even cards like Gravecrawler. Mm -hmm. So here it is, Ren in six. Uh, it's funny because all of the attention for the tournament has been on Hogak, but Ren in six quietly doing great work in any deck that can cast it primarily. Jund, that, that is where we see it. Absolutely, and it's, I think, the card that's kind of put Jund over the top and made it into a, a top-tier option again because we didn't see a whole lot of it at Mythic Championship London, but we've seen a resurgence of this, and that's because of this very powerful two-mana Planeswalker. He's going to use the uh, ability to get back the land, and Jacob's going to start applying pressure to the loyalty count of Ren and Six. Yeah, he had the option of sacrificing the Nihil spell bomb to exile the land to make to get David not to get the land back, but sacrificing a spell bomb to prevent the land while not having access to the ability to cycle the spell bomb feels pretty bad, especially in this type of matchup where every single card matters. Yeah, on top of that, Jacob, while he would have been able to keep that one land out, it's it's not like that's a permanent answer. There's a lot of fetch lands. Right. But here's the business. This is uh, one of the one-two punches again. New kids on the block here. Ranger Captain of Eos searching up <coughs> the death shadow there for Jacob Wilson. And we've seen him do this on camera throughout the course of the day. Very powerful interaction there as well. Just giving him uh, another threat on the battlefield with the Ranger Captain. And even perhaps that activated ability coming up in certain matchups too. And then, of course, you know, he gets to start playing uh, death shadows coming up. Yeah, the Ranger Captain of Eos just gives this deck an extra fo um, 
uh, extra redundancy. You know, you have the four copies of Death Shadow, having this be able to search out the best card you want. You know, I, and if you compare it head to head with something like a Bloodbraid Elf, it might even just be better because you're, you get exactly the card that you want f uh, in, in every matchup. Another fetch land here for David. With Ren and Six looking on. And David, given that he tapped the Overgrown Tomb, probably going to be looking to run out that Tarmogoyf. It's kind of a good old-fashioned creature fight here, at least yeah. to kick things off between these two decks. So he's going to target his land to get that back and see if Jacob has any interest in using that Nile spell bomb now. But he says no once again. And there's Tarmogoyf hitting the battlefield. That is a 2-3 Tarmogoyf. But Jacob about does, as small as they get. Right. But Jacob does have the option to sacrifice the spell bomb and exile his own graveyard. And that would shrink the Tarmogoyf down to a 1-2, meaning that he can safely attack <laughs> with both Tide Hollow Scholar and the Ranger Captain of Eos. Nile Spellbomb as a combat trick, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I think David, David might see that one coming. Yeah. Got to fill up the graveyard first and cycle through the deck, cycling that Street Wraith. This does mean that Jacob will be able to deploy the Death Shadow that he fetched with the Ranger Captain. So Ranger Captain is going to hit the red zone, presumably attacking Ren and Six. Wow, and look at that. David says, sure. He knows about the Nile Spellbomb Tarmogoyf interaction. He doesn't want to chump lock. And he just lets Ren and Six go. I, he's got to figure, look, I already got two lands back from it, and it soaked up some damage. I guess can't really ask for much more. Yeah. Plus, and it's, a redundant it, it, copy in his hand also. Right. And not really a top priority card in the matchup. Just doesn't really do a whole lot. I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't be shocked if he might even consider shaving one because it just doesn't do a whole lot when it's on the board. His hand is pretty much out of gas here as well. Tireless Tracker could get taken away here Absolutely. quite easily, and uh, that would leave him with not a whole lot going on. And look at this. Jacob keeps adding to the board, and he has built this thing out proper. Yeah, David really needs to find a removal spell to kind of chain the removal going, you know, target the Tide Hollow Sculler, get that Fatal Push back, then use the Fatal Push to get the Death Shadow off the, uh, off the board. But looks like he, mu he just found another land here, so things really tough here, uh, you know, Jacob might just be applying a little too much pressure here. And like you said, Ren and Six just a bit slow here. <clears throat> Not really doing much. And now Jacob deciding whether or not he wants to crack his spell bomb because he has mana available. Trying to look for the ideal time to do so, although it must be noted that in his hand he has Path to Exile as well. But uh, with the Spell Bomb, it is quite tempting. So Tarma Wife is now a 1 2 with only Ren and Six in the graveyard. We have a Planeswalker. Tarma Wife was the first time that Planeswalker was referenced, right? Uh, I, th I don't think I'd they even existed when they printed that card. <laughs> No, I'm serious. I, I, yeah, you, you might be right. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. I think, I think Future Sight, people were like, what the heck is a Planeswalker? <laughs> and then they were printed uh, just a couple of years later in Lorwyn. Yeah, and Jacob pretty much has this game locked up at this point. I don't know. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, he does. Right. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> Maybe if David has a sweeper in the main. Yeah, the really interesting part to me uh, have, has actually been the Tide Hollow Scholars because I mentioned that those aren't likely to stay on the battlefield against Jund. Well, they did. Right. And when they do, those are really hard to deal with because you're just getting a 2 2 that takes away whatever removal spells you have and it just keeps applying pressure to Planeswalkers and Life Total if you never find a Lightning Bolt or something to take one out. Yeah, and he does have plenty of removal. I mean, Lightning Bolt, Fatal Push, Abrupt Decay, Assassin's Trophy. He just was unable to find any of those cards. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, Ren and Six, while it can deal with some creatures, the two toughness on Sculler says no. And now David's in pure desperation mode with really no way out at this point, facing double Death Shadow, double Tide Hollow Sculler, and the Ranger Captain. Yeah. 
And when I was speaking with, with Andrew, I think, you know, we, we talk about Ranger captain being strong, but he also felt very strongly that silent clearing was a huge addition to making this deck viable. The fact that you have a land that you can cycle, the Horizon lands being very powerful, but also just being able to make it so that you can continue taking damage so that you can run out those Death Shadows. All right, that's game number one going to Jacob Wilson. He says, just like I drew it up, played a bunch of Tide Hollow Scholars against John, and they didn't draw any removal spells beyond the ones that I took away. So one of the good there for Jacob as he continues a run here potentially for another top eight, though he's still got a lot of work ahead of him. Two more rounds to go here from Barcelona. Welcome back to the booth. Marshall Sutcliffe with Paul Chion. And, uh, you know, this is where it all happens. This is the feature match area as well, because this round and next are going to dictate our top eight. And that, of course, is what it's all about when you walk in the door. Yeah, nothing is set in stone now. These matches are absolutely crucial. You have to win these matches. These players have three losses. A loss in this round means you are likely out of all right. top eight. Well, we're going to catch up with our match once again. But, sh uh, but first, the short break. See you in just a bit. I'm here with Andrew Ellenbogen from Team Cardboard Live now. Team Cobo Live, right now you're in sixth place overall for the team series. 93 points, and must say, a lot of them have come from you thus far. <laughs> Feeling pretty good going into the, the last event of this Mythic Championship series. How's your testing been? Uh, you know, it's been a mixed bag. I think a lot of different people were in different place about the format, and I'm not really sure we ultimately uh, came to an agreement, but uh, hopefully uh, it all works out and people's different roads uh, lead all of us to success. I mean, I guess that's one of the nice things about modern, right, is that you can have a favorite deck. There's a little bit more wiggle room in the format, maybe. Have you guys come to any kind of consensus in terms of deck choices or even uh, limited archetypes you like? Uh, I think there's, like, a lot of debate on all fronts. I mean, I think most of us all really like black in draft. I think we all think it's the best color, and I'm not sure everyone thinks that. Like, I think some people like blue more, some people like green more, but we're all pretty set on black's best color. I think we're all relatively willing to draft white, which not everyone is. Some people are, like, really off-white. Um, as far as strict dicks, though, I think we're, like, all over the map. Like, I think we're at least on... We might have six archetypes, six people. Like, it's there's no consensus whatsoever. So, I mean, I guess that at least means you're a little bit insulated if there's one deck that ends up over or underperforming. But in total, for you guys at Cardboard Live, it's probably going to end up that you're going to need to finish, like, if you want to make the final two, probably two full top eights ahead of one of those teams that are at the top. <laughs> a, a big set of prospects, something you think you can make it to? Uh, well, I think no one in the world, like, no team in the world is, like, favored to have two out of six members top eight or what have you, so we're obviously going to have to be lucky, but, you know, I mean, I think we are, I like where we're at, and I think we have a chance, and I don't know, I'm just crossing my fingers. All right, so we're going to have six sets of fingers crossed. Let's just run through who's in the team just before we close out. Sure. Uh, so the team is, our captain is, uh, of course, Marcus Luong, uh, master of restaurant selection on the team. Uh, and there's uh, me, there's uh, Vidianto Wajaya, there's uh, Rob Pisano, uh, there's Max Mick, and there's Bradley Yu. And welcome back to the booth here in Barcelona. Paul Chian, Marshall Sutcliffe. And we were talking about it before the break there, Paul, but this is where the big pressure is. It's kind of interesting because, you know, we do our best to bring that to you, uh, you know, from the booth here, but you can really feel it in the feature match area when you're down there. Things get a little more quiet, a little more stern. The top decks have a lot more gravity to them. And, Players slow uh, down, too. And they do. They slow down a bit as well. So let's uh, check back in on our feature match area here and see what we're looking at. You can see our main match. I mentioned it in the chat, but for those of you that weren't following along in chat, uh, we have Wafo Tapa versus Martin Mueller, as you can see, but they were actually deck checked at the beginning uh, of the of their round. So we decided to to start over there on David Mines and Jacob Wilson, uh, because you know sometimes deck, deck checks can take a little while, right? And uh, and we wanted to start somewhere, uh, but we will try to catch up with them if given the opportunity. We have not forgotten. Don't worry. Yeah, and uh, Guillaume still live with his trusty Esper control deck and, you know, actually has a new card in his deck. We have uh, Guillaume Afotapa on, of course, the trusty Esper deck. But actually, we're going to take a look here at David Mines' list. We have Jund, 
And uh, full four copies of Ren and Six. You know, we see some people playing three, but it looks like David really wants to maximize on the Ren and Six here. And also, you know, oftentimes you only see maybe one cycle land, but David playing two cycle lands along with that nurturing peat land. So guaranteeing that, you know, if the games go long enough, he will ultimately be able to use Ren and Six as a continuous source of card advantage, actual cards instead of just getting lands. You know what I'm seeing here, by the way, from the, from the new look from Jund? Converted mana cost is even down a little bit. Only one blood raid elf in the whole thing. You know, Ren and Six kind of taking some of those slots, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, really interesting. Also, Ren and Six, that has to be like the jundiest card ever, oh, right? Absolutely. Like you read it, it's like incremental, it gets you value or kills. It's just exactly what Jund Well, wants. I mean, it's a two mana planeswalker mm -hmm. that basically draws you a card every single turn and also deals with little creatures. So it's got a lot of flexibility. If you're playing against an aggressive deck, you know, you play against an affinity deck or the, the, the Hogak deck with grave crawlers, it has some utility there. Also very effective against humans, but at the same time, you know, with enough fetch lands and cycle lands, it also just draws you a card every single time. We, we also see Tireless Tracker here uh, being used by David with three of them in the main deck as the main card advantage engine for the late game. Yeah, just basically replacing Bloodbraid Elf as kind of the card advantage creature of choice. Exactly, so again, a, a a cheaper version, perhaps, of Jund, even a little more uh, down to the ground. Now, Jacob Wilson on the other side is running. Well, we've seen Shadow in many different builds. Grixis, we've seen Jund, we've seen Mardu here as well. What's the advantage of Mardu Shadow? Well, Mardu Shadow means that you are you basically have eight copies of Death Shadow in your deck instead of just four. Now, decks like Grixis Shadow would often find the Death Shadow because it has so many cheap cantrips, so many ways to dig through your deck to find it. But with this, you have Ranger Captain of Eos. This is a new addition from Modern Horizons. You now play a credible threat in the Ranger Captain of Eos, and then you can use those to dig up Death Shadow. On top of that, it has the added benefit of helping you play around sweepers. If you play against the a blue-white control deck. You can sacrifice the Ranger Captain of Eos on your opponent's turn, make sure they can't play that Terminus or Supreme Verdict, and then on your turn, try to get in for lethal with your Death Shadow. Yeah, we saw the uh, Gurmog Angler seems to be the thing that was cut. There's right. only one of those now where that used to be a four of. Yeah, Gurmag Angler, it's harder to play more copies of the card in this deck because it has less ways to kind of filter through all the cards. It's not even playing Faithless Looting. That's right. And so interesting, too, because then you just get more Death Shadows, which is what you wanted more copies of anyway. Exactly. All right, let's get underway here on our main match. It looks like, what is going on here? Maybe uh, Jacob's on a mulligan. Oh, the judge. Sorry, they're actually asking the judges something. So that's, what's, that's what we're looking at here. Yeah, but taking a look at Jacob's hand here, he's got Liliana, the last hope. We are in a game number two sideboarded match. And Liliana, the last hope, just a nice additional way to get back that shadow, especially in this matchup where David Mines is going to be playing multiple copies of Fatal Push along with Abrupt Decay and Assassin Trophy. You just want to have more redundant ways to get back that shadow. Because over the course of a game, it's very possible for David to just draw enough ways to just kill that shadow, mm -hmm. like all four of the death shadows. So it's important to have multiple ways to get it back. Liliana, the last hope, along with two copies of Coligan's Command in the sideboard, should help go get those Death, sh Death Shadows back. See a Vraska Golgari Queen in hand as well for David. It looks like the judge is coming over to answer any potential questions here. And hopefully we can get back underway. Yeah, it looks like he went and grabbed the nice Planeswalker from his standard Golgari deck. We haven't really <laughs> seen Vraska Golgari Queen make a huge impact in modern. So really interesting choice there. Actually, choosing to play that over Bloodbraid Elf. Um, you know, maybe one reason to not play so many copies of Blood Raid Elf is the fact that you have lots of legendary permanents in your deck now. If you play the full four copies oh, wow. of Ren and Six, along with the four, full four copies of Liliana the Veil, there's a reasonable chance that if one of those are in play, you're just going to hit another one, and it feels really bad. That's why you work at Wizards of the Coast, my friend. A, an astute observation, to be sure. I could also be completely wrong, and if you ask David, he just could just tell you that he doesn't nah, like Blood Raid that, Elf. That has to be a factor, <laughs> right? That has to matter. You think he lost to it in a PTQ 10 years ago and just never forgave it? Is it probably that, just happened way theory? too many times in playtesting. He's <laughs> yeah. just like, all right, all right, I'm, I'm sick of this. I'm going to go with Tireless Tracker. There you go. Tireless Tracker, a cheaper option, although often played with four mana or on the fourth turn anyway. Here's Ren and Six on turn two, right on time, and that's going to grab back a fetch land doing what Ren and Six does. 
And what's the play here from Jacob? He's got land number two, but nothing else going on. He's just going to pass the turn back. One, inter Ooh. one interesting card in Jacob Wilson's hand is Hex Parasite. That's a one of that you can search for with Ranger Captain of Eos, but it's also a card that's pretty effective at killing Planeswalkers. If you pay two life, you can remove a counter <laughs> from a permanent. So it's, again, a very expensive way to do so, but it does allow you to kill Planeswalkers. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's you can see it there on the screen, uh, but yeah, it's X and Phyrexian mana to remove up to X counters from target permanent. For each counter removed this way, Hex Parasite gets plus one, plus that one telling to turn. Yeah, primarily the reason why you have Hex Parasite in the deck is just to have an additional way to uh, lower your life total. With one Hex Parasite, you can basically just pay as much life as you want to remove zero counters from something. And by doing so, with just Hex Parasite maybe on turn one, turn two, you can just run out a pair of Death Shadows if you have them in your hand. The ability to lower your life total at will. Right. <laughs> Not something that most decks look forward to, but of course Death Shadow throws a wrench in those works. But ultimately, the Inquisition of Kozilek took away Ranger Captain of Eos, the better long game card. And Ren and Sick 6 already feels like the damage has been done here. And there's a Tarmogoyf as well, though, again, not a huge one. It is sitting right now at 2-3, but there is a Bloodstained Mire on the other side of the battlefield and an Arid Mesa that are likely to end up in the yard, and Jacob's going to go ahead and start cracking some fetches here, so 3-4 right. for the Goyf. Yeah, and he probably is going to look to preserve his life total here. We'll see, given that there's a Tarmogoyf already on the battlefield and he doesn't have a Death Shadow. But this, this hand is, this draw is much smoother for David. He's got the turn two Ren and Six, but he's got additional disruption this time around. He had the Inquisition, he has Tarmogoyf, and he has multiple Fatal Pushes in hand for Death Shadow. Goyf down, there goes Path to Exile to kill that. So a lot of mana available here for David Mines. He's uh, of course not missed land drops thanks to Ren and Six, but also getting a little ramp from Path to Exile, we'll see if he's got some, uh, some stuff in his hand to take advantage. Yeah, and the reason why Jacob is running, ran out that path to exile is he's very interested in playing Liliana the Last Hope this turn, and so he won't have access to deal with that Tarmogoyf that's in play. So path to exile the Tarmogoyf, then run out the Liliana, and, you know, start taking it up. He could choose to minus to get back the Ranger Captain of Eos, However, if he does, Liliana will go down to one loyalty, meaning that the Ren and Six can just pick it off. Oh, it looks like he's still just going to go for it here. Get back that Ranger Captain. Really needs to start Death, start, uh, death Shadow, the Death Shadow train going. Uh, you can see the players fighting over those. You know, this is Liliana getting it back. That one was taken away with Inquisition of Kozilek. I think they both know, ooh, how important it is. Huge By the draw. way, that was tireless tracker off the top of the library. Ren and Six uses uh, minus ability there to finish off Liliana the Last Hope. And now we're going to see the big hitter here. Boom. This is a huge part of David Mines' late game. Tireless tracker. And tireless tracker plus, plus fetch lands really annoying here for Jacob. It's going to offer not only a big attacker, but also a continual stream of card advantage for David. Jacob, he's really kind of up against it at this point. He needs to start applying major pressure to this board. Yeah, David's got the, the card advantage, the board advantage, the land advantage. This is going to be very difficult. And uh, yeah, games can just play out that way. The first person to have the hand disruption to make sure that they can execute their game plan smoothly is oftentimes the person who's going to come out ahead. But is J what what life total is Jacob at? Is if it's at thirteen, yeah, that, that wouldn't work. So we just we must not have it fully updated. There it is. He's at ten. Yeah, okay. So he's got a three three shadow and a three three ranger captain. So finally, he starts getting the ball rolling in a forward direction. The question is, can David find answers to the creatures on the other side of the battlefield with the cards he's going to get from these clues? So and many the answer is generally yes, yeah. right? I mean, his deck is full of them, and he has quite a bit of mana. Again, you got to go back to that path to exile on the Tarmogoyf. 
a necessary move from Jacob's perspective, but that land really mattering here as David's going to have a lot more flexibility with sacrificing clues and playing cards. Look at this. He's got Fatal Push straight away, and he used it on the Ranger Captain. That's not good news for that Death Shadow. Yeah, and he has all the options in the world now. David looks like he has a Tarmogoyf too. He can play a Vraska to also get Death Shadow off the board here. Vraska Golgari Queen then followed that up with Land Tarmogoyf to put more pressure on the board with three clues, with an active Renin 6, with Tireless Tracker. There's just so much value. This is exactly the stage of the game that Jund achieve, you know, is trying to achieve. And doing so at this point, this is absurd. Renin 6 getting back fetch lands with Tireless Tracker? Come on. Yeah. He now has three clues built up and an active Vraska Golgari Queen. Her plus two is you may sacrifice another permanent if you do gain one life and draw a card. And it looks like he wants to ask the judge a question away from the table here shortly. This, is, um, this happens sometimes <clears throat> with, uh, we call them oracle text or oracle readings, where it's you, you need to know what the most current, up-to-date version of any given card is. And oftentimes it comes up in situations where you are considering a card that your opponent might have, but you want to just be 100% sure how it works. Right, definitely. So, may choose to just get a basic land here to not take as much damage. David Mines actually has plenty of basics. He's got two forests, two swamps, and a mountain. One thing to be mindful of is just making sure you don't fetch out all your basics because if Jacob Wilson starts drawing Path to Exiles, if you fetch out all your basics, then you can no longer get lands. Got to think of everything when you're on the value train. There's Tarmogoyf hitting the battlefield. This game will not last much longer unless Jacob has some real haymakers on his side. He does have ways to steal games. He has Teamer Battle Rage in his build. I don't know if he's got them in post-board. Hey, look at that, Hex Parasite. Oh, he can kill Vraska. Yeah. Can he kill Renin 6? No, not quite. No. He can take f four loyalty counters off of it. Awkward. Yeah. <laughs> Given the five. So instead, he's going to go ahead and just pay. You don't have to pay life to do it. You right. can pay for the Phyrexian mana with regular mana if you'd like. Well, and this was a big turn for Jacob. He killed a Planeswalker and got three creatures down, including double Death Shadow. That's about the most you could ask for. Right, and he's gonna go down to nine here. He took a pain, a point of damage from the Silent Clearing. But David Mines does have at least one Fatal Push in hand, and with four clues, might just look to find more ways to get Death Shadows off the board. And Jacob Wilson also sitting at nine here. Ren and Six can take out the Hex Parasite then you can use the Fatal Push to kill one of the Death Shadows. But he might just, you know, he's got a Scavenging Ooze in hand. He might just want to look for an additional way to kill Death Shadow here. You by, know, it, by getting some of these clues. Right, because if he finds something like an Abrupt Decay, for example, Abrupt Decay plus push while pinging the Hex Parasite, that would mean that he's got, he would have a lethal attack. Oh, it looks like he's at six. Okay, so given that he's at six, if you can find a removal spell here, it will be a lethal attack. It's funny, he's got a lot of money in the bank here. All those clues, he hasn't actually cracked one thus far. There's Fatal Push, though. David Mines looking to even things up here in round 15 against Jacob Wilson. Jacob with a pretty clean victory in game number one. But it has been all David. And, uh, you know, this is not atypical as well. You know, Jund tends to have very good sideboard plans. And right now, he's forcing the issue here Jacob's got a block. And he has a block, Tireless Tracker. This is a lethal attack from Tireless Tracker because David can sack all three of the clues. Curious to see how big the Tarmogoyf is. He we pointed got... at it as if it were six. Yeah. Artifact. Oh, oh he put an that, artifact he in the yard? He killed oh, Hex Parasite. So yes. Yeah, we have Artifact, Creature, Land, Planeswalker, Instant. Is there a sorcery? Now, well, they counted it up, and I it looks like it was they enough. said it was good enough. Right. Big Tarmogoyf there to finish the job and give game number two to David Mines. These players post sitting at 11 and three and scrapping it out for potentially a chance in the top eight. Look, a loss here is 
potentially devastating, uh, likely devastating to your chances to make top eight. A win doesn't guarantee it, but certainly keeps you very much in the conversation. So let's take a live look in on what was our, our front table here. Again, there was a uh, there was a deck check to kick things off. And, and since, uh, you know, we don't want to have a camera pointed at <laughs> two players sitting there chatting with each other, we decided to start over on their other match. But that does mean we get to chime in or check in here and see what's going on between Guillaume Afotapa on the left-hand side of your screen. That's Martin Mueller on the right. These players uh, also sitting in 11 and 3. Everybody in the feature match area has the same record this round. Yeah, and Martin Mueller looks like he's up a game here. And, you know, Guillaume had to have been aware of Hogek, the Hogek that coming into the event. And it looks like he tooled his deck to at least have a better shot at beating the deck. He's playing three main deck copies of Kaya's Guile. One of the modes is exile all cards from target player's graveyard. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, but oftentimes that might be too slow, right? I mean, it's a three mana spell. And, you know, we talk about the Hogak deck just being able to put 10, 12, 14 power on turn two. So a lot of the times this Kaya's Guile is just not going to be enough. And Martin making an attack last turn to get Jace the Mind Sculptor off the battlefield. So Waffle without a continuous source of card advantage. Oftentimes these control decks try to run away with the game with a Jace that stays on the board safely or something like Teferi Hero of Dominaria. Mm -hmm. Looks like Martin's going to go with the Faithless Looting here. And one interesting thing to note with Waffle's deck, you know, many decks, many of the control decks um, have decided, look, I am not going to have a good enough matchup against the graveyard decks without playing some copies of Surgical Extraction. But... Wafo actually has zero copies of Surgical Extraction in his entire deck. There's a lot of those out in the field. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that is definitely the exception. Now curious to see if Mart Mueller's going to convoke out that Hogak or just choose to attack this turn. Oh, and he has a land, and when he fa flashback the Faithless Looting, he did have a Thought Seize, so this could try to clear the way to be able to cast that Hogak. Waffle's got a lot of good options here, it looks like, though. He's got Snapcaster Mage, Cryptic Command, and Supreme Verdict. There's your favorite. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Cryptic Command. I was wondering Can't if he was going to choose it to tap down the team, but, I mean, it's Guillaume. He's, of course, going to draw cards. Yes. <laughs> and it looks like he does have Celestial Purge in hand here that he could use on the feeder. Yeah, interesting to see if he chooses to maybe just block Vengevine and then use Celestial Purge on the feeder. That's the way to keep his life total the absolute highest, though if you do look, it is a pair of fetch lands over there for Guillaume Afotapa, and it could be a pretty painful operation here to uh, get that, uh, that Celestial Purge on the stack. Yeah. Alternatively, alternatively, maybe he just chooses to block the Carrion feeder this turn, fetch. You're going to go pretty low, but then you can cast a Supreme Verdict and then still keep up Celestial Purge next turn. Yeah, does he know that he'll be seeing a threat that's purgeable? That's kind of one of the issues, right? You can't purge Vengevine. Yeah, most of the threats in the deck are purgeable un unless Martin runs out the Vengevine or, of course, strings together two creatures. Mm -hmm. Just would be a shame to, uh, to trade off for a card that you could purge and lose to one that you couldn't. Yeah, I, I, think, I think given that he has his one black source, he might just go for two basics. Oh, no, okay, it looks like he went for Hallowed Fountain plus Island. Okay, so he'll take four damage in that transaction even Very then. Very painful. Ouch. So away goes the Carrion Feeder. That is going to get exiled, though not this time. He's going to sacrifice it to itself. Right, yeah. so clean play there by M Martin Mueller, just making sure. And he is going to trade off the Plague Engineer for the Vengevine. So Guillaume Afotapa currently stable at five life. He's down a game to Martin Mueller. 
and he's just going to pass the turn back. But now he's got Snapcaster Mage times two in his hand and a pretty stacked yard. Yeah, with Cryptic Command, that is exactly the type of card that you want here now. Snapcaster plus Cryptic Command is extremely powerful. And Martin's deck really not packing a whole lot of interaction. So, you know, at some point in the late game, he could even do something like Snapcaster Mage, Cryptic Command, Cryptic Command, counter something and bounce my Snapcaster to Ooh. get something else out of my graveyard. I got shivers, Paul. <laughs> The question is, he's deciding now, well, do I need to counter this Seder Wayfinder and just stop the, the process altogether, or is it better to make you actually hit something and then counter that? Oh, wow, and this was really strong Seder Wayfinder because now Martin Mueller can play a land, get Bloodgast into play, then still convoke out Hogak. And then when he does Ooh. that, the Venge Vines will also trigger from his graveyard. So hitting Bloodgast was huge. Wow. And Guillaume Afotapa can only look on as Martin Mueller starts to move his game plan forward, even if Hogak doesn't resolve. It's still going on the stack, and that's going to create the triggers needed. Yeah, it looks like Martin is going for it here. Because why wouldn't you? You get Hogak, and that still triggers the Vengevine, so you can't even counter that. Vengevine will enter the battlefield here. Can counter the Hogak. Oof. Yeah. The haste on Vengevine, very relevant this time as well, with Guillaume's life total so low. Yeah, I can imagine something like a Snapcaster Mage here on Cryptic Command, tap down your team, and maybe bounce the Snapcaster Mage, or Snapcaster Mage and Cryptic Command tab draw card, some, some, something like that. Oh no, Esper Charm. To so draw to? Definitely looking for something here. He's so got he, that long game plan. So it looks like he chose to block with Snapcaster Mage then targeted Esper Charm, played Esper Charm. No, no, he hasn't blocked yet. Okay. All right. Wait, no, Vengevine doesn't die. So it looks like Wafo is just looking to chump block here, try to get ahead on cards, and he's going to run out a Supreme Verdict yeah. and hope that Martin can't rebuild here. But he can, right? I mean, right. he just kind of always can. Yeah, I mean, he will be able to get Blood Gas back into play, but the important thing is that Martin can't cast two creatures because of the trigger on the Venge Vine. Wafo does have Path to Exile, however, so he does have a number of answers here now. But it does feel to me that he probably wants to play Supreme Verdict unless he wants to just play it even more. And Wafo's playing it extremely patiently here, just hoping that Martin adds more to his board here. He's you know, with, with the board the way that it is now, I imagine he's going to be looking to use that Snapcaster Mage for cryptic. some cryptic command value. Mm -hmm. Tap, tap the draw. Team. Yeah, tap and draw. And boy, he has the tools to win the late game, no doubt about that. Jace the Mind Sculptor and Teferi, Hero of Dominaria in hand, but he's got to be alive to do so. And now is this the point where he goes for the Supreme Verdict? Because if he goes for Supreme Verdict, he would clear the board. Martin would still be able to put a hasty blood gas back into play, but he does have the answer in that in Path to Exile. <laughs> Mar yeah, this is definitely Guillaume committing to Supreme Verdict by attacking with the Snapcaster Mage, because why not? Writing's on the wall. Get in for free damage. And yeah, Wafo had a couple of options there. Can just pass to keep a path to exile. Can also fetch a basic land and play Plague Engineer, naming Vampire. To get that blood gas out of the way. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Two Venge Vines hits the graveyard. Does he have another creature? Oh, he's got another creature. He oh, has a Stitcher man. Supplier, Paul. 
That was, yeah, a, any Ooh, creature would have done because wow. I think he had one in hand. And hitting those Venge Vines means that I think he's just going to have it. That's three That's Venge three Vines. three Venge Vines that all get to attack wow. right now. And even though Guillaume Afotafa has a path to exile, it's not going to be enough. And Martin Mueller wins the match two games 2-0. Always calm in demeanor is Wafo, but that was a tough loss for him, likely eliminating him from top eight contention. Yeah, Guillaume still had a number of things that he had to fight for, even if Martin didn't find those two additional Venge Vines, right? He still could have just, you know, he would have gotten the Venge Vine path, but he still had that Blood Gas, which is an extremely problematic creature to deal with, you know, for the blue-white deck, because Guillaume would have exhausted his, his exile effects that he had in hand. So the control master, Guillaume Wafotapa, going down and picking up his fourth loss, meaning that it's going to be very unlikely for him unless he has one of the best tiebreakers in the room. And wins. And wins. <laughs> and sneaks in if there is a slot available. Because sometimes it is a clean cut to top eight. That's right. That happens especially when you get the numbers up a little higher like we have for this particular event. But back to our what ended up being our main table here, Jacob Wilson versus David Mines. Kicking things off for David, Inquisition of Kozilek. And look at this, he's got the backup here. You, Jacob Wilson has the Tide Hollow Sculler, but he also has the Unearth. So David, if he takes the Unearth, he gets Tide Hollow Sculler. If he takes the Tide Hollow Sculler, Jacob will just unearth the Tide Hollow Sculler. So regardless, Jacob will be able to take a look at David's hand next turn to see if he can strip a removal spell, if possible. So it might be better to just take the unearth and make David, sorry, make Jacob tap out to cast the Tide Hollow Sculler because if he takes the Tide Hollow Sculler, Jacob could still potentially draw Inquisition or Thoughtseize and play unearth plus Inquisition next turn, stripping two cards out of David's hand. All right, going for the value card here because Coligan's Command is just a natural two for one. Jacob likely going to be taking six damage this turn. Yeah. It's going to go from 18 to 12, so can already start running out Death Shadows. It's always funny. Taking six damage, ouch. It's like, well, no, that's, yeah, uh, yeah. that's a good thing. I want to do that. Right. And this does mean that he is now below 13. But first things first, Tide Hollow Sculler goes on the stack. Does it see removal spells? Oh, yeah. Two of them, Lightning Bolt and Abrupt Decay in hand for David Mines. So this time the Sculler is not as likely to, uh, to survive. Yeah. I imagine Jacob's going to take the Lightning Bolt here because David currently cannot cast the Abrupt Decay as he has Overgrown Tomb and Mountain. Of course, he's very likely to find mana for the Decay at some point, but for the time being, it would make sense to take the Lightning Bolt. Oh, never mind. Going for one of the big creatures instead. You know how it is if they're going to kill it anyway. Yeah. You can at least slow down but, the offensive but game. But now David drew Inquisition, so he can double spell this turn. He can go Lightning Bolt plus Inquisition to Kozilek. It's really nice. And that is one of the benefits. David, again, you know, he's got the Ren and Sixes. He's got this very lean, this uh, Jun deck. Yeah, he, and being able to double spell early in the game is, is a big benefit. Or he could just run out scavenging use. Mm -hmm, he could. It looks like that's what he's opting to do here instead. Gives him a lot of flexibility, and he knows, you know, what's going on in Jacob Wilson's hand at the moment. Ooh, Path to Exile off the top, though, could send that scavenging use packing. Although if he does, that would give David access mana to be able to cast the Abrupt Decay in his hand. Funny. Yeah. And Jacob it goes, hey, if you want to trade your scavenge <laughs> use from a Tide Hollow Scholar, let's do it. Trades I don't, trades these, uh, yeah, I don't mind turning my Tide Hollow Scholar into a removal spell. We are in a game three decider between these two players. And again, it's all on the line. 
the loser is going to find themselves with four losses and even with a win next round is going to be hard pressed to make it into the top eight though not technically impossible your your hopes are really quite dashed at that point where a win here could put you in a position to either be in a winning in next round or you get to control your own destiny or maybe even draw in <clears throat> depending on how things break for you David with another Inquisition of Kozilek, but its effectiveness is going to start wearing out as the game goes on. And it's always been an interesting talking point for players who play these mid-range decks with hand disruption. You know, just how much of those cards do you want to keep in in the matchup? Because oftentimes it just, it just comes down to top deck wars as both players are stripping each other's resources or, you know, using a bunch of removal spells to get creatures off the board. And drawing an Inquisition, you know, turn seven or eight of the game just doesn't do a whole lot. Yeah, this has been a fun one to watch. I'm not going to lie. A lot of interaction here. A lot of decision points for the two players about how to manage their resources. They're both playing a similar game plan in the sense that uh, the one with the most resources at the end is probably going to win the game. But if you let one of them get going, they can run away with the game and you can't catch up. Right. So they're walking this fine line between deploying their own game plan while still stifling their opponent just enough to stay ahead of them. This is a lot different than uh, some of the other matchups we've had. Yeah, and David going for the exiling Street Wraith plan here instead of going for the Inquisition of Kozilek. Getting that scavenging use to a 3-3 no longer can die to a Coligan's command. But Gurmag Angler is quite hey, strong still here. here. There's only one, but there it is. What you play, but you play it to draw it. That's right. And there's Lightning Bolt finally to kill that Tide Hollow Sculler to free up the Tarmogoyf that was hidden underneath it. But yeah. that Gurmag Angler is going to need an answer. Yeah, but this Tarmogoyf is going to be pretty big, right? We have Artifact, Creature, Instant, Sorcery, and Land. So it's actually a 5-6. <laughs> Off of four cards. Off of four cards by killing <laughs> an artifact you, creature. Sculler. So it's just going to be bigger than the Gurmag Angler here. But of course, we know that Jacob Wilson has Path to Exile. Path to Exile is in hand, so he might choose to take, a, take an aggressive line here. And look <laughs> just at this. drew another Sculler. Yep. <laughs> Too bad the Tarmogoyf's on the battlefield already at this point. But, but things looking good for Jacob. He's got the land advantage here as we see David Mind stumbling a bit. And he has options, right? And you can't definitely. ask for more than that. He's got Path to Exile in his hand, or he can run out Ranger Captain of Eos. Maybe even some other options, you know, including that Tide Hollow Scholar that we mentioned. And I see a Nile Spell Bomb as well that he can use to uh, alter the power and toughness of the Goyf. Yeah, I mean, I would be tempted to run out the Sculler here, get more information, and then maybe go for an end of turn path to exile. But let's see what Jacob opts to do here. He can also play out the Spell Bomb to shrink the Tarmogoyf. And that means that he can just get a big attack in with the Gurmag Angler. The threat of activating that Nile Spell Bomb is right. going to allow the Gurmag Angler to strike. The question is, does he even want this race to happen? Right. right, because that does open up the door, because in that case, David says, sure, I take it. But he is taking a big hit on the swing back. It would certainly price Jacob Wilson into playing the path to exile in his hand, but it looks like that may be his plan anyway. Yeah, he's just going to pass the turn back with path to exile available and Gurmog Angler on defense for the Goyf, which has now been shrunk down significantly. It's a 3-4, so not going to be able to get through the Angler. Yeah, and a big draw here from David. What did he find? He found a land. He found a Verdant Catacombs. Huge. Absolutely huge. That window is actually starting to close on David. Uh, you know, his deck does require a significant amount of mana. First things first, though, he's going to force the issue. And that's going to mean that if Jacob wants to resolve Path to Exile, he's going to need to cast it now. And he says, you know what? Fine. If you want it, you can have it. But that means that I get Ranger Captain of Eos on my side. So at this point, you can just take the path to exile. 
because you have that additional Vernon Catacombs. So you take the path to exile, make sure that Jacob can actually cast that. Then you play the other Inquisition to get the Ranger Captain of Eos out of his hand. Then you just have a, you're gonna just have a better board. You're gonna be able to either grow that Scavenging Ooze or also this Tarmogoyf. Curious to see what this Tarmogoyf is going to ultimately be. It looks like four or five, right? Because no, no longer, there's no artifact in the graveyard anymore. We have Sorcery, Land, Instant. Oh, it's just three, four right now. Yeah, two Inquisitions. Yeah. But if he does take the Ranger Captain, for example. Yeah, that would do it. That would turn it into a 4-5. So again, sigh of relief there for David Mines on his draw step with this Verdant Catacombs. This is uh, opening up a pretty potent turn for him. Yeah, Dave, David now just deciding whether or not he wants to get Basic Swamp or perhaps an Overgrown Tomb. Mm -hmm. Basic Swamp means you get to preserve your life total. Overgrown Tomb means that you have the potential option of activating Scavenging Ooze multiple times. So he's got that Inquisition of Kozilek at the ready. I imagine he's going to fire it off here, given that he went to go fetch the Swamp, get that right. Ranger Captain Evios out of Jacob Wilson's hand. Right. That's what I'm thinking, too. He already has the answer for the Tide Hollow Sculler in his hand in the form of Collective Brutality and Abrupt Decay. So either way, it'll die. So this, the cards are lining up pretty well actually for David. And he's gonna be a little bit ahead here. Of course, Jacob at any point can draw another Ranger Captain of Bios, but I imagine he's gonna take the Ranger Captain. Yep. Jacob then plays out the Tide Hollow Sculler, takes one of the removal spells, but then David untaps. He can still play out one of those removal spells, killing the Tide Hollow Sculler, which would then grow the Tarmogoyf to a 5-6. Only one green source. Oh, he took the Sculler. Interesting, okay, so this means David wants to be really aggressive here. He gets to attack with Tarmogoyf. Jacob's not gonna chump block here, I don't think, but given that there's that lone mountain in play, this is kind of scary. Yeah, he took the Sculler because it was an artifact and a creature, it pumped the Goyf by two. Wow. Although the question is, if you're afraid of Lightning Bolt, don't you just attack with both? If you have Lightning Bolt, do you just attack with both creatures? And hope that Jacob just eats your scavenging ooze and then you bolt him with the... If you, if you did have if a bolt. If you did have the bolt, mm -hmm. right. Sure. Which is why Jacob is also not afraid of bolt and took the damage. That's right. So Ranger Captain of Eos hits the battlefield. Oh, but he's going to die here, right? He's, he has to play the, the Death Shadow. And David Mines has Collective yes. Brutality. And he's going to use the, mine, the, the Drain 2 effect here for the last two points of damage. <laughs> Look at that. David oh, Mines wow. in He's game number bolt three. Why not? And he actually finds two different ways to win. Lightning Bolt or Collective Brutality. And David Mines is keeping his dream alive here at 12 and 3. Likely eliminating Jacob Wilson. Again, we don't want to be too committal to that. It's not 100%. We do occasionally see players sneak into the top eight with four losses on their record. But at a field this big, it is quite difficult to do so. You know, it's not even guaranteed that David Mines gets to go in. Yeah, and you just saw, you know, that was just the classic mid-range matchup. Both players just hand disruption spells and removal spells back and forth. And David just ultimately, you know, with that key Verdant Catacombs to be able to get the last few cards out of Jacob's, interactive spells out of Jacob's hand to get him for those final few points was, was crucial because Jacob had the opportunity to cast that path to exile on that Tarm Wave, but yes. he chose not to. Yes, he and, said, sure, take what right. you want. And as a result, he ended up getting punished and lost. That's right. It's not always the most exciting cards off the top of the library that matter. Verdant Catacombs was the key point in that game, and it got there for David Mines. He is now 12 and three. We're gonna take a short break. When we come back, we'll have time walk for round number 15. Don't go anywhere.
And welcome back to the booth here in Barcelona. We're down the stretch of the tournament. If you're just joining us, we're watching Modern. It's round number 15. There's only one more round in our Swiss portion to go before we cut to our top eight. So the slots are getting filled. People are getting eliminated left and right. And we've got time walk magic lined up for you here. In the time walk seat this round is Jelger Vigersma playing against Adriano Moscato. And again, like everybody in the feature match area this round, they're all sitting at 11 and three. Yeah, and Jelger on Hogak. And Adriano Moscato on Humans. As you can see, we're coming in in game number three here. So this is going to be the decider between those two. Yeah, and Adriano with lots of graveyard hate, it looks like. There's That's a turn one Graf Digger's Cage. And I think I also saw a Surgical Extraction in his hand as well. Would you have played Humans uh, if you were participating in the tournament, Paul? I think I would. I, I, I just, I'm, generally, I'm just kind of comfortable playing that deck, but I can see the case for not playing it because a lot of decks got stronger and humans really didn't get a whole lot. It got maybe one additional Horizon Land to put into its deck, but you know, with the emergence of a lot of other powerful options, Ren and Six being very effective against the humans deck, along with Plague Engineer being a card in a lot of black decks, uh, you know, I think that's one of the main reasons why a lot of players have kind of shied away from playing this yeah. when, you know, a lot of new toys out when, there. when before it was kind of the creature deck to play. Yeah, you know, the only one that I've seen uh, is the Unsettled Mariner, and that isn't a game changer. That's right. a, a little bit of a different look and not enough to say, all right, well, yeah, that's you know, where we see Ren and Six and Hogak, you know, right. those are game changers. But I will say that the Humans deck does have a lot of ways to interact with what the Hogak deck's trying to do. Reflector mm. Mage on Hogak is quite strong, along with cards like the Deputy of Detention. Now, one thing to be said about the Humans deck, especially after Cyber, you can see what happened here. Adriano Moscato played turn one Graf Digger's Cage, turn two Graf Digger's Cage. But what that means is that's just less humans in his hand. So that Champion of the Parish looks a lot weaker. It's just you're playing a much slower game plan. You're not really putting pressure on the battlefield. And if that happens, you know, it's possible for the, the Hogak deck to just start, you know, trying to fill up its graveyard, get a Hogak. Uh, and then if you draw Hogak, you can just start playing those out of your hand. It is funny, this is a classic balance that you have to try to hit where you have enough stuff so that they can't just go one run wild on you. But Moscato uh, has the double cage that you mentioned and he has um, surgical extraction in his hand as well. And as you mentioned, none of those are humans. Right. <laughs> you know, he's got this champion of the parish, but normally when you see a champion of the parish, that's the type of card that can just go nuts. And we won't see that here from Adriano. So interesting here, Yelgar does have Faithless Looting and now he has a bunch of cards in hand and he does have a Hogak in his hand. So Graf Digger's Cage stops Hogak from being cast from the graveyard. However, you can play it out of your hand. And Adriano Moscato needs to have, find an answer. Look at this, look at all this hate. <laughs> but if you just draw the Hogak, you're still playing an 8-8 eight, eight Trampler here. That is here. just unfair. He's just <laughs> turn casting two. it. <laughs> it's like, look at all these cyborg hate cards. Now, Adriano Moscato needs to have something like a Reflector Mage or a Deputy of Detention. He, he does have Reflector does. Mage, but he doesn't have land this number three. This is ridiculous, Paul. I, I just, <laughs> I can't even. He has double Grafdigger's Cage Surgical, and Yelger's like, cool, bro. Here's Hogak. A 2-1 and a 1-1. One, one. I have 11 power on turn two. I don't care what you did. And this is why most people in the tournament, if you really want to beat the Hogak deck, Cage sometimes just doesn't get it done. You need to play Leyline of the Void. And that's why it's the most card played card in the tournament because Ley Leyline of the Void means there's no graveyard for your opponent to you know, delve the Hogak into play. Man, if Adriana would have had two copies of Leyline to kick things off, this would look much different. Yeah, absolutely. Now, so Adriano has to find land number three here. He needs to be able to play that Reflector Mage. Otherwise, this Hogak is going to end the game very quickly. Oh, he's getting gacked. There's no doubt about that. The question is, can he find his way out? And how long will it take? Unbelievable. <clears throat> Hogak. Arisen Necropolis. Welcome to modern, my friend. Yes, yeah, smashing in for 10 here. Moscato is down to seven. Uh, realistically, he has next turn, right? right. Uh, not literally, but realistically. Let's see what he's got. Land? Is there a land? Land? No! Nope. It is a mana production source. It is not a land. 
Yeah, this is tough. So <coughs> now he can play out a Thalia's lieutenant. And if he does play out the Thalia's lieutenant, he's going to make a 4-4 champion of the parish. And he's going to have a 3-3 meddling mage. So he can put all of his creatures in front of Hogak. But then he's going to have an empty board. And Yelger can still try to reload. If he sacrifices Stitcher Supplier, that's more cards in the graveyard. Yeah. And if he draws another Hogak, he can play it. Of course, if Hogak is in the graveyard, you can't recast it. Also, Adriano's life total is not 17. It is not. He is down to 7. Now, that is, by the way, a green source here for Yelger. He does have, if he can find oh, another wow. one. Oh, he has an Abrupt Decay here, too. Yes. Yeah, this is basically just over. He has a Vengevine in his hand that he could cast with another green source as well. If he finds a Fed. Oh, yeah. and that's, a and that's actually a, a big draw because if Adrian Moscato. Yeah. Yeah, and that's going to do it. Yelger, Vigershma, gacked him good, Paul. Yep. And, you know, I got to say, that's a Hall of Famer right there. It's sitting at X and 3 <laughs> coming into the last round. And I think the last event he top it was another modern modern, modern event. With, with Twin, I remember with, that. It, it was with... It, it <laughs> 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 Yelder just likes to play the really, Is really powerful decks. there a decks. pattern here? <laughs> we will uh, stay tuned and see how Yelger ends up doing if he makes the top 8. Maybe he is the measuring stick that we need. Now, uh, we're going to go right over to the news desk for all of the updates and news from what's been happening out on the floor in round 15. We'll see you back here for round 16 in just a bit. Don't go anywhere.